Hi fellow geography students, this is Mrs. Wildy. This is our video lecture over chapter 11, Agriculture. We're going to mostly focus on the three agricultural revolutions and the history of those, but we'll also talk about where agriculture stands today and the changes that, that have happened as a result. So the first key question that we want to answer is what is agriculture and then where did it begin? Again, the first agricultural revolution. So agriculture is the purposeful tending of crops and raising of livestock. It's important to understand it's not just growing the fruits and vegetables, but it's also the raising of livestock in order to produce food or um, leather or hide or any sort of material like that that we use from the agricultural product. The field note specifically discusses the soybeans in western South Dakota, um, specifically because they are Roundup round up ready soybeans. So it's a GMO, genetically modified crop, that um, has a part of its genetic code in it that prevents it from being affected by Roundup uh, herbicide. So the weeds die, but the but the soybean itself does not, um, which means that a farmer can plant Roundup Ready soybeans, spray his entire field with Roundup, and the only thing that dies are the weeds. So within agriculture, and, and really we talk about this with lots of different chapters, but in terms of agricultural activities, economic activities, most of the Things, the, the jobs that we talk about within agriculture are going to be primary economic activities. Farming, for example, fishing, even aquaculture would be an example of primary. Logging, mining, anything you're going to the land um, and getting a, a product from it. That's a primary economic activity. Now, if we take something from the land and then make another product from it, we've moved into secondary. So if we take the uh, the lumber that has been chopped down from the tree and we build or construct a house with it, that would be secondary. If we take the fish from the from the river, we are taking a prime that's a primary economic economic activity. But if we then can it or or put it into tin form in a in a factory, we've moved on to secondary. Um, just in terms of going through the other economic activities, not, not necessarily related to agriculture, tertiary economic activities are those that provide a service. So most jobs that you see on a daily basis are going to be more tertiary. So doctors, lawyers, um, teachers, uh, people who do your hair, who fix your car, who plumbers, all of those people provide a service. That's tertiary economic activities. Quaternary are where you have experts in both information to, um, and exchange of, of money or also like uh, government related. So it can be a stockbroker or a financial analyst or the Federal Reserve pres president that dictates the interest rates. Um, quinary economic activities involve high level research and development usually related to education. So it could be a college professor, but it also could be a NASA physicist or a, um, a researcher of cancer. Um, so back to, to agriculture and the first agricultural revolution, the, the, the main point I want you to understand from this is that there are two main developments that led to the first agricultural revolution. That is plant and animal domestication. And as a result of, of domesticating plants and animals, people settled down in one place they, and they developed a surplus of those agricultural products. They were able to keep extra so that in a time of worse weather or climate change, perhaps, they could have food that they could still eat. This transformed the way that humans lived. It's been called the worst mistake in human history because it led to things like inequalities in society, um, social stratification and slavery and, and um, destru destruction of the environment, all sorts of negative things. It also led to technological advances. So because we had an excess of food, we were not constantly trying to feed ourselves. We were able to put our energy and our, our talents into other places and develop more technology as a result. 
So the first agricultural revolution began about eight to 10,000 years ago. It's, it's subject to change based on who you ask um, and the research and, and area, but it also developed in five major river valleys of the world. So um, definitely within Mesopotamia, we have plant and animal domestication. Those rivers would be the Tigris and Euphrates. In South Asia, it would be the Indus River. East Asia would be the Yangtze and, and Yellow River. In Egypt, it's the Nile. And then in Mesoamerica, you have the Rio Grande and the Sonora and Yaqui Rivers. So all of those places are, are river valley civilizations where agriculture began independently. They had no knowledge of each other and they all developed plant and animal domestication. So um, seed crops probably were, were first domesticated in Southwest Asia. Root crops were first in South and Southeast. These are uh, also, Carl Saar is one of the major geographers that, that studies the, the Neolithic revolution. So he actually has 11 areas he identifies as being areas where ag agriculture innovation occurred. But, but you really need to just make sure you know those big five. In terms of animal domestication, we know for sure that plant and animal domestication together both started in the Fertile Crescent. Um, the major the major crops of the Fertile Crescent are going to be seed crops again, so wheat and barley. Um, and the cow also was first domesticated in Southwest Asia. When we get into the next chapter, which is the urban geography, it will this this will all come up again because the first agricultural revolution led to the first urban revolution where we created cities. Back to animal, animal domestication, it's really important to know the big five animals that have always been domesticated all over the world. Sheep, goat, cow, horse, pig. Uh, remember we watched Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, the first episode, and we talked about the fact that in Papua New Guinea, the only animal that is there to be used for, for um, farming is the pig, and it didn't even, wasn't even original or um, native to Southeast Asia, they haven't been able to develop the same level of technology that you find in other areas because of their climate, because of the, of the crops that they are only able to grow, and because they don't have all the animals that have been domesticated. Most um, people started off when farming began, they started off as subsistence agricultural uh, agriculture. They were growing food simply to survive. So we still have that today in some areas of the world. Certainly it's more peripheral countries that you're going to find more subsistence agriculture. Um, usually that happens through shifting cultivation. This is where, where tribes or small groups of people live in a place for a little while. They may engage in slash and burn where they cut down the trees, burn them, and then that puts nutrients in the soil. They can, they can grow crops on that land for a few years and then the nutrients are used up and they have to shift their population to another area slash and burn there grow for a few years and then shift again that's all part of subsistence agriculture this is a really useful map showing you where subsistence agriculture um, is pertained mostly um, usually it's in tropical and subtropical zones um, and around the equator and the other thing to keep in mind is that this is shrinking. There's less land available for hunters and gatherers or for subsistence agriculture to take part in, mostly because the cities are in increasing, but also because of environmental problems. There's not as much land to be able to have space for subsistence agriculture to take place. So in terms of the second agricultural revolution, this happened much later. It wasn't in the Five River Valley Hearths. It began in Great Britain and then spread throughout Europe and then across the ocean to the United States. But it began in the mid to later 1700s with a series of inventions that helped again, provide a surplus of food. Things like the seed drill from Jethro Tull or um, advances in livestock breeding where the animals were, were bred to be bigger, stronger, um, more able to, to help out with the land new fertilizers we have new crops coming from the Colombian exchange from the old world from the new world to the old world and old world to no, new world and so people want to, to plant those new crops they didn't know about before the enclosure act made um, smaller farms um, basically be enclosed into larger areas so that more land could be farmed 
And then crop rotation also allowed more land to be farmed. So at the end, you have, again, more high yielding crops, more food, more surplus, which then people go, what are we going to do with all of these, these crops? And they invent things that lead to the Industrial Revolution, which is also the second urban revolution. So that's that That's that in a nutshell. One of the major um, theorists of this time, and this is really right at the, the time period where the second agricultural revolution has taken, taken root, but the, the Industrial Revolution hasn't yet quite taken root. Von Thunen came up with his theory about German farming, um, German towns. Um, and that theory was 1826, 1825, I can't remember exactly, but the point is it has to do with the way people lived then, determined how their cities were, were organized, and really we're not even talking about cities, we're talking about towns, villages, so you always have your central city in the middle of the ring, or it's, or um, with center with the first ring around it, really. And in that first ring is where you're going to have your perishable fruits and vegetables being grown and harvested. So as soon as they can be picked, they are sold in market that same day. This also involves the dairy cows will be found there because, again, they're going to be milked on a daily basis. You do not have refrigeration, so the milk has to be sold immediately. And in that case, you've got um, those particular agricultural products are going to be closest to, to the market, to the city. Next ring is forest because forest uh, firewood is used on a daily basis and it's heavy. So again, Von Thunen has a lot to do with the cost of transportation, which has to do with weight and distance. So the forest needed to be closer to the town because it's a heavy thing and it's used, used quite a bit. The third ring is going to be your extensive field crops like grains, barley, corn, um, those can be further away because yes, they, they first of all aren't as perishable and secondly, they're lighter weight. So you can take more of those on a, on a cart with a horse back to town and it's not going to spoil on you and you can carry more of it. And then the last ring is the ran ranching or livestock. Again, it seems like these would be heavy objects, these cows, these, these, um, these livestock animals but they can be walked back to market to be slaughtered and sold for meat and, and hide rather than having to carry them back. And that's the advantage there. Obviously, this isn't truly um, relevant as much anymore as it was in 1826, but there are still places in this world where people still live this way because they don't have refrigeration. They don't have um, technology and transportation to be able to transport things farther. So they still live with this kind of mentality or they, they design their towns to be in this form. Um, Li Lu specifically talks about this in China where we still have more organic, carefully grown things closer to the village and the further away you get, the less um, care, care is maintained. You may have more pesticides and herbicides being sprayed. Um, because it's extensive agriculture and it's further away. We also can apply this on a country basis. So if you look at these, these are two different examples. If New York City is your only market, is your central city basically, then we still have areas of our country devoted to one particular agricultural activity. And it may not be in exactly the same order as Von Thunen, but it still applies in terms of what areas of our country grow certain agricultural products. So the third agricultural revolution is also known as the Green Revolution, and this is more recent. This started in the 1930s, but really took off more in the 1960s. And Norman Borlaug was instrumental in this. He was very much about trying to feed the world, and that's the main goal of the third agricultural revolution. So developing hybrid seeds or genetically modified seeds that can grow certain crops in places that didn't normally grow those crops, like in drought resistant or make it, make it um, areas that are very dry or very wet so that you can have more food um, that didn't used to be be there. So hopefully you can feed people. Um, golden rice, again, is one that, that gave vitamin A in the diet to help people get a vitamin they didn't normally get. So this, this was certainly a major part of, of the third agricultural revolution and the major goal. 
what we're going to do is sort of pause here and the next video will kind of take on more of the modern agriculture that we that we talk about.